Hi everyone uh, and welcome to the launch of this uh, new pamphlet, uh, People Before Profit, The Future of Social Care in Scotland. Uh, my name is Ian Ferguson, I'm a member of the Social Work Action Network uh, and we have jointly produced this pamphlet uh, along with the, the Jimmy Reid Foundation. Uh, the, the, the starting point for the pamphlet really was the horrific situation we've faced in Scotland and in social care in Scotland uh, over the past year during the, the COVID crisis. Somebody commented that the crisis had thrown, it functioned a bit like an x-ray, it's really shown up the kind of society we live in. We've seen the massive levels of both racial and economic inequality that has led to many more low paid workers and, and black minority ethnic workers uh, dying than other people. Uh, we've seen the fact that the essential workers in society are not the Richard Bransons and the Jeff Bezoses, but home carers, nurses, uh, transport workers, retail workers, these are really the essential workers. But what the, what the crisis has also highlighted and what we're going to talk about tonight is really just how broken uh, our social care system is here in Scotland. Uh, we've seen the catastrophic death of 18, 1,800 older people uh, in, in, in residential care homes uh, early in the crisis people who are often shifted from hospital to care homes without testing, with money suddenly been found uh, after years of saying there was no solution to the bed blocking crisis. We've seen workers being forced to work without proper, proper PPE. Uh, and we've seen thousands of disabled people in the community suddenly finding their services withdrawn and then left to cope on their own. So that's the background. But of course, the problem with social care is much, much older than COVID. Care system in the UK has been broken for, for, for many decades, really since the introduction of the market and its social care uh, by the Tories back in the 1990s. And really in the, in, in the 30 years since then, social care has gone from being mainly a publicly provided, publicly owned service to being one now dominated by private providers, the likes of Southern Cross or Bupa or HC1. And only last week we saw some, what, what that means in terms of social care when HC1 announced uh, that they were closing 10 more homes in Scotland which leaves 750 workers now fearing for their jobs uh, and many residents very anxious about what will happen to their futures. So really that's the context for, for the pamphlet for tonight's discussion. In response to that crisis the Scottish Government set up uh, the independent review of social care, the Feely Review. Now I'm sure several speakers tonight will comment on the Feely Review, there are things in it that we welcome, there are things that are positive, but I think our concern that is on the central issue, on the central issue of who owns social care, uh, then the, the Feely Committee does not recommend taking social care into public ownership, which means that our service will continue to be dominated by, by the HC1s and so on. So that's really what we want to discuss tonight. We want to look at what has happened to social care during the crisis, what has been the experience of workers and service users, and what kind of changes do we want to see? What kind of campaign do we need to bring social care back into public ownership? Uh, we've got some excellent speakers tonight. More than 30 people have contributed to the pamphlet, including leading trade unionists, journalists, MPs, campaigners. Sadly, we can't include them all tonight, but we've got an excellent lineup of speakers that I'm going to uh, introduce to you. So without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker tonight. Our first speaker is, uh, is, is, is Shona Thompson. Uh, Shona is the home carer with Glasgow City Council and is GMB Scotland branch secretary for the Glasgow branch. So thank you, Shona. Um, thanks very much, Ian. Um, uh, so happy to be here. Um, if I can just relate to you um, the experiences of the, the, the home carer over this last year. I mean, um, and just uh, uh, see some of the changes that, um, that we feel in home care, you know, as a must um, going forward. Now, home care has always been a statutory service delivered to a vulnerable uh, across Scotland. Uh, long before the ongoing uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, as the country went into lockdown in March 2020, um, home care was one of the services that had to continue going, had to continue. The fears of the nation that followed were colossal. But if you, you could, if you can imagine the fear faced and the pressures placed in frontline carers, had no choice 
than to still continue doing their face-to-face -face jobs. You know, they, they were there to assist and care for the vulnerable uh, throughout this pandemic, knowing daily they were tending a COVID positive service users with, you know, farcical basic PPE as per Scottish guidelines for protection. Um, you know, th th this was not, it was stressful. It was, it, it was just unimaginable, you know, it, the, the fear every day. So, I mean, GMB home care members themselves challenged the Scottish government for PPE, uh, for additional PPE, albeit masks were um, added later on. Uh, but still, the daily uh, confusion, fear, what was different between PPE for home carers and that what was used in the hospital, it, it was confusing, you know, and the daily pressures just started mounting and concerns still at the ludicrously. Uh, I will go on about the PPE because it was the minimum PPE and it afforded no overall protection in their role against COVID-19. Um, the, the carers, you know, we all did to all, all do their best um, to protect themselves, their families uh, daily. But I mean, they're overwhelmed now, they're suffering, they're still suffering mental and physical obstacles daily. I've spoken to his colleagues in tears as they themselves have underlying health conditions. I mean, they, they are just, just, just besought. The things that I feel that need to change from a home carer's perspective is a national care service absolutely is long overdue. And that is needed to enable better standards in care to be supported and implemented. And again, from a home carer's perspective, is that any of these upcoming boards or committees, they must include frontline representation from the workforces. They're the ones that have the skills, the insight and the knowledge and experience required to address the necessary delivery of this vital social care service. There must be a national service that includes support for carers. So I'm demanding what will actually for the Scottish Government to recognise that a, this underpaid, overworked, often forgotten workforce of skilled workers, as the true professionals have always been. We're registered by a SSC, a governing body. We have regular PV checks, we're trained, qualifications, skills and experience to enable us to enhance the daily living and care needs of the vulnerable. Scottish Government need to formally recognise that caring as a skilled profession, not by clapping, or by an insulting £500 pro rata thank you, but by paying carers across Scotland a minimum, and I'm saying a minimum, of £15 an hour. GMB members demand to be valued and paid their worth. They deserve that right to be fully recognised for the professional work they deliver. And if anything society has gained this past year, it's how vital social care is for our vulnerable. And I'm so proud of every carer who has shown unselfish commitment, but now we want and we need the government to step up and support carers across Scotland. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sean. That was a really powerful contribution. I think the demand for 15 pounds is one we should support. I think also your point about this, the need for a, a democratically controlled national care service, not a top-down one, is a really, really important point. So thanks very, very much for that. Our second contributor tonight is also, is also a care worker, a residential care worker. Uh, Savio de Souza is a, a care campaigner. He's written a really powerful contribution to the pamphlet, uh, both of his experience and also the experience of black minority ethnic workers during this crisis. So Savio, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Neil, and thanks for inviting me uh, to give a contribution to this. 7% of the workforce in Scotland work in the social care sector. So Significant numbers are ethnic minorities and women. It's hard for people on the front line delivering personal care to be heard and listened to. It's even harder for ethnic minorities to be taken seriously in the assumption that they weren't born in the UK or that English may or may not be their main language. 
The pandemic, although painful, however, has blown the cover on the health and social care sector and exposed what's really happening in social care with a significant number of the COVID deaths being from care homes. The UN has warned that by 2030, there will be a shortage of care workers worldwide by 30 million. For too long, governments, employers, and sadly, even some trade unions have ignored the warnings of staff and the opportunities to instigate change. Even our own Scottish Health Secretary at the care conference recently acknowledged that care homes are not just there to care for residents, but also staff. If staff values are compromised, then they leave, creating a shortage. Many care workers, especially from the Bain community, regularly face racial abuse, assaults, 200 to 2,000 times a year is not uncommon. With no confidence in reporting systems that will affect change, many suffer in silence. Time after time, care workers routinely face shortage of staff, inappropriate PPE, incorrect or faulty equipment. The Fair Work Initiative and the FILU Review must not yet become, must not yet become another report like so many over the past 50 years that have promised change that delivered the status quo for care workers simply to gather dust on the shelf. I myself became a victim of COVID after a resident sneezed in my face. I was hospitalized um, and faced being off work for three months with no pay, with no compensation, not in this 500 pound review, being an agency worker, many face hardship and we have to, we can't miss this opportunity for change and really affect change. And we need to empower care workers to be heard, to be listened to and to take part in the process. For far too long, the regulators have failed to not take their responsibilities and ensure we are listened to and heard. So thanks very much for allowing me this contribution. And I really hope that we can instigate change and to have a better care service. Thank you very much, Savio. Again, another really perfect contribution. Uh, and just mentioned in terms of challenging the, I think that the experience of the BAME community is one of the worst aspects of this whole crisis. Uh, and I'll just mention here, Swan is supporting the SDUC, uh, or sorry, the Stand Up to Racism Day of Action on, on March the 20th. Uh, it's me to challenge racism wherever it appears. Our next speaker, uh, is, is, is Jim Woodward. Uh, Jim is a long-time campaigner uh, for disabled people's rights and is chair uh, of the Glasgow Centre for Independent Living. Uh, so over to you, Jim. Jim, thank you Jim, for inviting me to speak. And if people don't understand my speech, please indicate and I'll try and repeat. The pandemic has shown that disabled people are citizens are in a very precarious place within society. From being forced to say do not resuscitate no to having a social care support reduced, even stopped, but still being forced to pay the charges for them. A routine therapy and medical checkups have been cancelled, leading to higher risk of greater mobility. Those in receipt of care at home were often the last to get PPE. As a PE employer, I was the last to get the board to become a good employer. My local authority looked upon me as a client, not as an employer. Therefore, 
any new social care system must be allowed to have the duty to empower as well as the duty of care. Looking forward, we need to view social care as an investment in society, where the cost of social citizenship is seen as an investment, not a burden, where disabled people of whatever age seem to be seen as invalid invalid, but respected as citizens whose support are as valid as non as non as non invalid people. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim. And I think that that phrase that a new social care system has a duty to empower as well as a duty to care is really, really important. And I think that again, we have to ensure that any, the new social care system is shaped from the bottom up uh, involving service users as well as, as well as frontline workers. So thank you very much for that, Jim. All the way through this crisis, it's not been easy to resist because during lockdown, it's not been easy to organize collectively. Uh, but one organization that has attempted to organize socially distanced protests and take initiatives has been the Glasgow COVID Action Group uh, linked to the national organization People Before Profit. So I'd now like to invite Helen McFarlane, uh, who's also a Unite Union representative, to say a wee bit about that. Thanks, Helen. Thanks very much. So yes, I'm a member of the Glasgow COVID-19 Action Group, People Before Profit. Um, I also work for the NHS in Scotland. I'm a Unite trade union rep and I sit on the Unite National um, Exec as well. But I'm speaking as a member of the Glasgow People for Profit group where I was one of the co-authors for one of the articles in the fantastic pamphlet that really um, expresses so many voices around the needs for care in Scotland. So we're a group who meet online. Um, we're trade union reps from a range of different trade unions. We're political activists and we are local community activists. And um, we met up and we wanted to hear the personal stories and we wanted to take action to show support. So we're part of a national group and we have a national emergency program to fight against the inequalities that COVID has exposed. So our national emergency program includes a call for safe workplaces, PPE, um, for dignity in our welfare system, for um, making sure it's not workers that have to pay for this crisis, but that we tax the rich, that we extend the furlough scheme, and that we demand green industrial jobs for a new and different um, way of, of delivering our society going forward. So very broad um, group. So back in March last year, our group invited health service workers in the first place to come and share their experiences, but very quickly care workers and the close connection between the NHS and social care was so evident to the group. So we also organized an online meeting where we focused on social care. We had speakers thinking from a care home experience, but also from care at home. We heard from the experience of people relying on the care services as well as um, frontline workers. So we've held on online meetings and we've had speakers, including politicians, trade union and STUC leaders, researchers, journalists, but it's always been about including the voice of lived experience. So we've heard from the care worker, we've heard from the refuse collector, the teacher, the early years practitioners, call centre workers, pupils in schools and students at uni. So we've heard that range of voices. And as our group name suggests, we've been about action. So we've organized some socially distant protests. We've organized banner drops in parks and on bridges. We've organized a car cavalcades, put posters in our windows, and we've made good use of social media, whether that's been tweeting and using social media. So just as an example, even when we were in extreme lockdown, um, we have found ways to try and have our voices heard. So a walk, a permitted daily activity, even in the extreme um, parts of lockdown. 
has been transformed into each of us making a banner, walking to our local park, wherever that was, putting our banner up in the park, taking a photo, and then we've uploaded our photos. So it's individual actions linking to each other, but becoming solidarity actions. And for care, whether you and your family rely on care now or in the future, or whether you work in care, then it's solidarity actions that will help our voices be heard. And that what we need is a care service that is fit for the future in Scotland. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and I really recommend that pamphlet to everybody to read. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. That was a fantastically inspiring contribution. And it's, it's wonderful that even during this lockdown, people before profit and the, the COVID action group has shown that resistance is still possible. So thanks very much for that. Our next speaker is, is, is Laura Owens from the Save Our Build campaign. Uh, I talked earlier about the impact of the private sector, but actually marketization also has shaped uh, how the third sector performs. I'm gonna ask Laura to say a little bit about her experience during the, the Save Our Build campaign. Laura. Hi there, thanks very much, Ian. Um, and thank you to the Social Work Action Network and the Jim Reid Foundation for asking me to contribute to the pamphlet. I too would um, highly recommend it. Um, yeah, so, my sort of story began in 2017 when my gran became a victim of the build closures. Um, basically, every resident around Scotland who was in a residential care home belonging to build was written to uh, in what felt like a very much overnight decision to close all of the residential care homes in Scotland. As I say, it affected 167 residents which who were, who were um, essentially being made homeless by build. Um, it also affected 200 workers, highly qualified, skilled, experienced workers um, who were essentially facing redundancy. Um, the Build had, had, had quite a, had always been known as being sort of like the benchmark in care. Um, it's byline home for life, um, sort of suggested to both my, myself and my mum who had helped place my gran in their care that she would have a home for life and that she wouldn't have to consider any other place to live and she could live out the rest of her, her years there and in comfort. Um, the thing about, the sad thing about um, Beale Care Homes closing was that, as I say, it was considered the benchmark in care. It offered a very, very personalised, um, individualised um, home from home almost. It, it differed and it, it differed from many other homes that we had visited because they were very small units. Um, the rooms were, were fairly large. They had en suites, they had um, uh, sort of kettle facilities, things that you often don't see in kind of larger run care homes. So we were really, really devastated to hear that after around about 18 months, my grand was going to have to at the age of 87 move yet again. Um, it resulted in us um, setting up a campaign, which as Ian correctly pointed out, was called Save Our Build. Um, and along with other campaigners, people whose mothers, fathers, grandparents were also victims of the closure, we got together and we managed to get um, 10,000 signatures, just short of 10,000 signatures, that presented to the Scottish Government in an attempt to get them to take some action against the, against the closures. Um, we campaigned tirelessly for months on end to try and get them to take it seriously and really uh, highlighted to both Field, local authorities and the Scottish Government that there was, undoubt there was no doubt in our minds that um, people would die as a, as a result of um, the, 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 the forced closure and forced move uh, of, of, of um, Field. And sadly for my gran, she, after being, after having to move from Beale, she, she um, survived only a matter of months in our new care home. Um, and there is no doubt in both um, my mind and my mum's mind that that was a result of the closure and the, the forced move. Um, sadly, the, the thing about Beale was it was always considered um, you know, charitable, not for profit. The sad thing is though, it also became a victim of the marketization of care. Um, Ian correctly pointed out at the beginning, um, the likes of Southern Cross and HD1 um, has, has, uh, has often um, put, put profit before, before, um, before people. I didn't think we would see that with Build, and sadly we did. We, they, they decided that um, their model of care was no longer financially viable. And as I say, um, 
my grand my gran essentially lost her life because of that. Um, the, the thing about the marketisation of care and is that, as, as um, previous speakers have pointed out, is that it often, often leads to um, precarious contracts where workers are, are, are working on zero-hour contracts. We've also seen in the past year around COVID that zero-hour contracted workers can often be put from one care home from the, to the next without um, any consideration given around the sort of the, the, the risk that they run and uh, in, in taking infection into care homes. And sadly, we have seen a number of um, deaths in care homes that, I, in, in my view, and I'm sure many people's view here, would have been avoidable. Uh, the Save Our Build campaign didn't achieve their um, ultimate um, goal of, of saving the, the care homes, and, and many people um, did have to move elsewhere. Um, but what it did... Uh, what it did to, for me conclude was that there is absolutely no um, room for making profit out of people's vulnerabilities. Um, and, and yes, the Philly report points out some, some really good, uh, there's some really good ideas in, in there about trying to improve social care for both the, the users of social care and for workers within social care, but it falls short hugely around um, uh, as, as weeding out uh, companies that, as far as I'm concerned, exploit um, exploit vulnerability. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. That's another contribution. And just when you're, you're talking uh, about the small care homes that Beald ran, one of the whole points, of course, about the big, the big companies, the big multinationals, is that they go for economies of scale. So we see bigger and bigger, uh, big, bigger and bigger homes. And also, for those of us who work in social care, we know that one of the most important things is continuity of care. And sadly, uh, as we found out last week, people in 10 homes run by HC1 are going to face exactly the same kind of anxiety and the same kind of stress that your, your gran very sadly faced. So thank you for that contribution. Okay, folks, uh, one of the great things about this, this pamphlet has been it's been a joint production. It's been really good. Uh, for the Social Work Action Network to be working with the Jimmy Reid Foundation. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome as our final speaker tonight, uh, Lynn Henderson. Lynn, uh, as well as being the past president of the STUC, is the current chair uh, of the Jimmy Reid uh, Foundation uh, project board. So Lynn, I'll hand over to you, thanks. Thank you very much, Ian. And thank you to all the uh, contributors to the pamphlet and to all the people that have spoken um, here just now. I'm personally extremely humbled to be on a panel with, um, with so many people committed um, to bringing around change in care, because I think the crisis in care in Scotland and in the UK is the biggest crisis um, that we face, not just now in COVID, but in the future, the kind of society that we are going to be coming out of COVID, then care needs to be upfront and centre to how we respond. I want to thank Ian for doing so much of the groundwork in, in pulling this pamphlet together. It really is an excellent publication um, and the Jimmy Reid Foundation is, uh, is delighted to be associated with it. I just want to say a little word about my own personal experience. I grew up um, <clears throat> with a mother who was a home help, as they called them back in the day, who spent much more than 15 minutes in people's houses looking after. And she, she had you know, established and deep and meaningful relationships with the people that, that she worked with in our community. And I think it's sad that that, that in-depth relationships um, you know, have, have not been able to be sustained because of the short amount of time that the carers uh, who then went on to look after my own mum in her latter time um, you know, were unable to spend the amount of time that they would want to have spent with her and she would want to have spent with them. Um, my mum moved into a care home last February at the start of lockdown um, we saw her twice and then she, um, you know, she was, we had window visits and garden visits like all the other families in Scotland, but the people that, that worked and still work in that care home um, were incredibly committed 
to my mum and to all the people that they looked after. And they were incredibly hardworking and um, I cannot thank them enough for everything they did. And I think it's an absolute scandal that they are surviving on such low wages and terrible conditions. And yet, and yet, they're there for um, the people that they're looking after. So I want to thank all of those, those care home staff. The, the Jimmy Reid Foundation does welcome the Scottish Government's commissioned Feely report. And like Ian, we say there's, there are some of the proposals that we can certainly agree with. However, um, we think you need to do more than talking about establishing a national care service. I think we need to be talking about establishing a nationalised care service. Regulation is good and we support regulation, but not regulation just to allow private and privatised profit-seeking organisations to take their cut from our people and our communities. We want to see a lot more done about the terms and conditions and pay of those working in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in care across all elements of care in Scotland. We want to see proper resources put in to care and we want to see link ups between users, unions, the workers and the, and the communities in which we are organising. And I think what Helen said about community action um, is incredibly powerful and that it shows that even during lockdown that you can provide solidarity and you can, uh, and you can, you can make your point. And I think that's, that's, that's an amazing thing to do. So I'll just finish by saying again that you know, the Jimmy Reid Foundation is, um, is so pleased to be associated with this pamphlet and we want to take it out to the rest of the trade union movement and, and stimulate real discussion about what kind of care society we want to see coming, at, coming out of this. And we want unions to work together um, to make sure that it isn't just a a report from the Scottish Government that talks about nice things, but it's actually, if we're talking about a national care service, then we would like a nationalised care service. So thank you very much. Thanks, Lynn. Another great contribution. I think your point there about, about relationship-based care is so important. Certainly, I feel, and I'm sure a lot of people would agree, that a service that relies on 15-minute visits it doesn't really deserve the name of, of care. Uh, and I think also the only way we're going to get that kind of service is if it's a nationalised care service. I just want to end by thanking all of our contributors tonight uh, and also all of the others who couldn't be on tonight but who have contributed to the pamphlet. Uh, we don't want this pamphlet to lie and get dusty on shelves. We want people to, to use it, to, to, to buy the pamphlet, to read it, but order it for your union branch to invite contributors to the pamphlet to come and speak at your local organisation, trade union branch or whatever. Uh, I don't think we're going to get the kind of national care service we want to see without a real campaign from below involving workers, service users, campaigners, and so on. So the pamphlets of tonight's meeting is, is, is the first step in that, that process. Please share the video, buy the pamphlet, and thanks very much. <laughs>